Dina, maybe just while we're waiting for Wes to turn on his camera and his microphone, maybe I can ask you, how long have you been involved with Robinhood and how, how did you first get involved? So um, I actually first met Wes, which is an interesting story. Um, in 2005, he had just returned from Afghanistan and, he, and had been awarded a slot as a White House fellow. And a one Condi Rice asked me to interview all 12 applicants and to make sure we selected the very best one. Uh, so he was uh, our White House fellow at the State Department in 2005 for the full year. And then of course, stayed good friends with him, admired all of the incredible work that he did after that. And um, I've been involved in Robin Hood for all, you know, for 12 years because as the president of the Goldman Sachs Foundation, we did a number of, you know, a, a lot of work. And then I became vice chairman of the board about a year ago. Fantastic. And can you tell us while we're waiting for Wes's um, Wi-Fi to come back on, will you tell us a little bit just about what Robin Hood does? Sure. It's the largest poverty alleviation organization in New York and the surrounding areas. Um, during COVID alone, um, we have been the, um, pr well, let him say, but the nonprofit that has supported uh, more relief efforts that have been very devastating, as you can imagine, to the city. Um, one in four children are hungry in New York today, so many of them getting their meals at school. Domestic vi violence has shot up 50%. So I'm very proud to say that Wes and the leadership of Robin Hood and the team, um, I think, have done more than any nonprofit in New York to try to support uh, the, the vul most vulnerable in the need. They really have. Wes, welcome. Thank you. I'm glad we got your microphone and camera working. I've already introduced you and Dina, and I just want to lead us off. You know, I said by way of introduction, if we're not strong and have our house in order as a nation, and that means in terms of racial equality, income inequality, poverty generally, we cannot lead on the international stage. Now you straddle that more than anyone else because you served in Afghanistan, you were a White House fellow, now you lead Robin Hood. Can you say a little bit about how you see that intersection? And then secondarily, and I'm sure Dina will ask you about it too, what exactly has been going on with Robin Hood because you guys are really at the epicenter of the COVID 19 pandemic and all of the resulting devastation in the middle of New York. So, so happy to have you here. Thank I'm you. I'm so happy to be here, Anya, and, and thank you. And, and it's great to see everybody. And uh, anytime I get a chance to be in conversation with, with Dina Powell McCormick, I am better because of it. Uh, I always say I've had the pleasure of working for, for Dina twice. Once, uh, once I, when I came back from Afghanistan inside the State Department now, as she's serving as the vice chair for, uh, for, for Robin Hood. But, I, but more importantly, I've had the pleasure of being friends with Dina uh, for, for well over a decade. And so I'm just uh, I'm honored to be here and honored to be in, in conversation. And, uh, and, and Anya, you know, the, the, question, the question is an important one because the truth is, is that American leadership matters, right? American leadership matters from, from, from our very origins and from our very core. If you look at the amount of countries that have framed their constitutions after ours, uh, that have framed their founding documents, after the founding documents of the United States of America. The fact that the United States of America on so many fronts has, has you know, really, really led uh, when it comes to how we are thinking about the construct of individual governments and societies to thinking about the giving that the United States has, uh, has, has, uh, has demonstrated across the globe. Now, it's still also understanding that all of that was happening at a time when the history of the US has still been very uneven that the history of the US has still also been very unequal. And so when we're thinking about the things that we are going to need when it, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to how we think about moving forward, you know, the reality is, and why I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this conversation, is when we talk about some of the greatest national security threats that we have, you know, that we have around us, and we can, collect, we can point to a collection of things uh, internationally. But the reality is that some of the greatest national security threats are realities such as the fact that a quarter of our population doesn't even qualify for military service. And that's oftentimes because of educational or, or, uh, or, or health limitations, things that we know are controllable. You know, the reality is, is that, you know, prior to, prior to COVID-19 in, in New York City alone, half of the city was living in poverty for at least a year over the past four years, prior to COVID-19. And so our ability to be able to be that beacon of strength, 
our ability to have that measure of credibility, our ability to continue to, uh, to, to take that, that mantle and that mantra, take it seriously. Uh, a lot of it depends on our ability to unearth as much human capital as we have within our own communities, within our own societies. And, uh, and that's the things that I think, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing where we've got to put that real level of focus because what we've seen from COVID-19, um, you know, even before COVID-19, we've had massive disparities that needed to be addressed. But once we, what we watch now is not just an exposing of those, but it's been an absolute exacerbation of the challenge that we've been talking about. Thank you. You're so right. I'll let Dina take it away and I will pop on again near the end of our session. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Anya. It's such a delight for me to have the opportunity to moderate this conversation. Uh, and I, I have to say, I, there's a, a little bit I just have to brag about uh, when it comes to Westmore. Uh, you know, Wes uh, grew up between Baltimore and the Bronx, uh, a single mom, an amazing woman who uh, saw that her son was going to play a very important uh, role in, in this world. And uh, he had a little bit of a rough patch, which we can get into. I think it makes uh, the success all the more amazing. Uh, but he eventually ended up uh, at Johns Hopkins, graduating Phi Beta Kappa, uh, applying and becoming a Rhodes Scholar, working at Citigroup uh, in investment banking, but then having a calling after 9-11 to serve and going and serving in Afghanistan as a combat vet. And uh, it's really an extraordinary life. And he is one of the most humble and dedicated leaders. We're very proud to have him uh, leading Robin Hood today, the largest poverty alleviation foundation uh, in New York and the surrounding areas. And I always tell Wes, this is your moment. Your moment has really come. But I wanna take Wes back a little bit to some other moments when he realized that there was a calling for him. And it really revolved around two people uh, that kind of crossed his life. Uh, the first was another Wes Moore, uh, a gentleman who grew up a couple blocks away, very similar circumstances to Wes, uh, but somehow instead of ending up in uh, Afghanistan, ending up as a Rhodes Scholar, ending up as a White House Fellow, he is sadly serving life in prison. Wes, will you tell the story of the other Wes Moore and why you chose to write that book about him and how relevant his story is in what we are dealing with today in the United States. Yeah, thank you. And you know, I, I remember when I when I first even learned about him. It was actually it was actually from my mom. Uh, I was in South Africa doing a study abroad program, and then she called me one day and she said, you know, I was like, is everything okay? Because you know, this is this is before the days when you could make you know Skypes and free phone calls all over the world. This is when a phone call overseas was a really expensive venture, and so I was like, "Is everything okay?" And she said, "No." She said, "Everything's fine." She said, "I just have the craziest thing to tell you." She said, "There are wanted posters all over your neighborhood," and 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 I wasn't trying to be funny, but you know, I, I grew up, you know, where my neighborhood was was over in, in at the time over in uh, you know kind of northeast Baltimore, and so wanted posters. Uh, it wasn't something that I thought really justified a long distance phone call. And I said, okay, that's okay, but why are you calling me to tell me that? And she says, because they have your name on it. And that was the first time that I learned about Wes Moore. And I learned about the crime. I learned about the fact that, he, that, uh, that four guys walked into a jewelry store one day in a botched armed jewelry store robbery, ended up murdering an off-duty police officer, a person who was a 13-year veteran of the Baltimore Police Force. He was a three-time recipient of Police Officer of the Year. He was also a father of five who just had triplets. And, uh, and he went to work one day and he didn't come home. And these wanted posters were all over the neighborhood because the police were looking for Wes Moore in connection to the crime. And finally, after 12 days, they finally caught all four people. And, uh, and that was really what made me want to learn more about this crime, made me learn about this tragedy, but also made me want to learn more about Wes. And one day I just decided to write him a note. And, uh, and a month later, I got a note back from Jessup Correctional Institution from Westmore. And uh, that one letter turned to dozens of letters. Those dozens of letters turned to dozens of visits. Uh, I've now known Wes for over 17 years. He is now in year 20 of his life sentence without parole. And a couple of the big things that, um, that I learned throughout that process uh, was, you know, one, was how thin that line is between our life and someone else's life. Where, um, where I say, you know, the, the chilling truth is that his story could have been mine. 
knowing my history, knowing my background, knowing the fact that we lived two blocks away from each other and came up in similar circumstances, uh, similar challenges, and, uh, and that the chilling truth is that his story could have been mine, but the tragedy is that my story could have been his. And understanding that line, that distance between who we are and where we go and those who oftentimes society we think are just so distant and so far off, but actually it's, it's fractions, it's minutes, it's moments, it's interventions that actually do make a crucial difference in where we end up. And then I think the big thing was, uh, you know, he helped me to really think through this idea of environments versus expectations. And I remember once he said to me, we we're talking about Baltimore and he said, and I asked him, do you think that we're products of our environments? And he looked at me and he said, actually, I think we're products of our expectations. And as soon as he said that, I thought to myself, he is absolutely right. And I remember someone once said to me, it's a real shame that you lived up to your expectations and Wes didn't. And I said, actually, the real shame is that we both did. We both ended up exactly where we thought we would at some point. And because the expectations that people have of themselves, they're not born from nowhere. They really are born from the expectations that other people have of them. And they internalize them and they make them their own. And so that was a really important process, getting to know Wes, uh, building a friendship with Wes. Um, and, and, uh, and now, and not only did eventually I end up you know, writing about it, but it, it is something that really does in many ways serve as a, as a compass in terms of how I think about my work and how I think about the things that I, how I want to spend my life. Just such a powerful story. And I remember when you first told me, I, I actually got goosebumps. And he said, basically, I lived up to my expectations. He and ended up exactly where he thought he would. He really did. Um, and sadly enough, those expectations, to some extent, um, were dampened from a very early age. And so were his opportunities, a, a lack of good education, a lack of a support network. And that's a little bit the story of the tragic um, killing of Freddie Gray. Yeah. And you've just come out with a book um, about the, his life in Baltimore. And it's uh, really moving because it doesn't just talk about what happened in those five days when he was in custody and then very tragically died at the end of those days. Uh, but what happened literally from the beginning of his life uh, when he was in utero Will you just describe all that you found out about his life and how not only were there expectations issues, but challenges from before he even was born? I, I really wanted to, in, in trying to tell the story of Freddie Gray, where I feel like oftentimes the entire narrative that was developed was what happened the day that he died, what happened in terms of police interaction. And, and there is, and you know, I make no bones about the fact that we have to be able to address inequitable policing because it is real. And we are watching example after example how it is showing itself, how inequitable, how inequitable policing you know, uh, you know, shows, right? Whether, whether you're talking about you know, the names of a George Floyd or whether you're talking about the fact that George Floyd actually represents a whole list of much longer, a much longer list of names that are now repeatedly caught into this cycle, whether that is Eric Gardner or Sean Bell or Walter Scott or Philando Castile or Michael Brown or Breonna Taylor or Sandra Bland or Laquan McDonald, right? I mean, so we're watching this list of names. But the thing that always struck me about Freddie was if you look at Freddie's life, you know, we actually have to mourn that just as much. We have to mourn the fact that it's not just his death that should make us stand up and take notice. It was not just the fact that this was a 25 year old young man who made eye contact with police and ran. And that was his crime because in a high crime neighborhood that is enough to justify probable cause. And he's arrested an hour after he is arrested, he's in a coma. And he spends the next week in a coma until finally he passes away. And we spent so much time focusing on what happened in that time period of the arrest. But really with this book, I also wanted to spend time talking about the 25 years prior and talk about the fact that this was a young man who was born premature, underweight, and addicted to heroin. His mother battled addiction for much of her life. She never made it to high school. She could not read nor write. When he and his twin sister finally gained enough weight to leave the hospital, 
they moved into a housing project over in North Cary Street over in West Baltimore. And, uh, and that house that he moved into, along with 480 other homes, were actually cited in a civil, in a civil lawsuit back in 2009 because of the endemic levels of lead inside of that house. You know, the, the CDC indicates that if someone has six microbes of lead in every deciliter of blood, that that person will have cognitive damage for the remainder of their life. Freddie Gray had 36. So this was a young man who was born underweight, premature, addicted to heroin, and was now lead poisoned. And by this time in his life, he was two years old. His last recorded date in Baltimore City Public Schools was in the 10th grade. He was 19. He had been in special education classes his entire academic career because of the lead poisoning. And when I think about the reality of the life of Freddie Gray, this is a young man who never had a chance. This is a young man who, and, 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 and it's really, it's, it's heartbreaking to think about this idea that arguably, maybe, the most peaceful week of his life was the week he was in a coma. Because at least that week he was surrounded by doctors and nurses. And at least that week he was surrounded by lawyers and activists. At least that week the entire city knew his name. And at least that week, the entire city cared whether he lived or died. And I don't know another week in 25 years prior where all those factors would have been true. And that's the thing that I also wanted to, to highlight and profile is that even in this moment where we understand, uh, you know, so much of what is driving us to this moment, so much of what brought not just the nation, but the world to this moment is the fact that we saw we saw on camera a man handcuffed, face down on the ground, pleading for his life until he no longer could had the breath to plead for it anymore, while another man had his nonchalantly put his knee in his neck. We saw that. And that's what brought us to this moment. But the reality is, when we're talking about justice, justice is not just simply about banning of chokeholds. Justice is not simply about eliminating no-knock warrants. Justice is economic justice. Justice is environmental justice. Justice is health justice. Justice is, 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 uh, is economic justice. Justice is thinking about why a life like Freddie Gray that we spend a lot of time focusing on what snuffed it out at the end. But the reality is it was snuffed out a long time ago. And this was a young man who in many ways and for no fault of his own, was living on borrowed time from Jump Street. Mm -hmm. And that's what we as a society, we've got to wrestle with that. And we've got to wrestle with that complicity as well. Wouldn't you say that that story, the, the sad story, the sad life of Freddie Gray is an example of what you describe when you talk about systemic racism? Absolutely. That, that is an important term that I think we are all finally really recognizing, uh, institutional bias. Uh, Mayor Landry was on the call and, and he just texted me. He, he doesn't go through the chat room because he's got my phone. <laughs> just texts me when, <laughs> when he has good points to share. And I would say one of the most powerful things that, that he saw under his leadership as mayor is that we got to stop talking about this as incident by incident. Yes. This, this is, help, help us define systemic racism. How do you define it? Obviously, it is illustrated in the life of Freddie Gray and, and many others. What's your description? It's uh and 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 hey Mayor, Mayor Landrew, uh, uh, you know it's 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 one of these things, and he's absolutely right that I think oftentimes we 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 misconstrue what actually racism is because we do look at it as if it's an act, right? Where if a person does something that is an act, like that is racist. So a person, but what it also does is it lets us all off the hook far too easily where we can say, well, I don't use the N-word or I don't, you know, attend white supremacist rallies, so therefore I'm not a racist. Racism isn't an act. Racism is a system, right? It's a system that allows these levels of discrepancies and disparities. It doesn't just allow them to take place, but it's the reason for them. You know, it's impossible to talk about the life of Freddie Gray or the life of many people in Baltimore without understanding the history that 
not just racism, not just incidents of racism, but systemic racism played in the environments and the communities that people are existing in. It's impossible to talk about the way that East and West Baltimore are structured without understanding the history of redlining and without understanding the history of discriminatory housing policies and discriminatory lending policies and the Homestead Act and the unequal distribution of the GI Bill, right? We're talking about policies that were incredibly deliberate and incredibly color-coded. And so racism and systemic racism is this reality. It is this distinct understanding of the amount of discrepancies that we see is not because of individual acts or because of individual hard work or, uh, indi or an individual not working hard enough. The fact that we have a racial wealth gap in this country that is literally 10 to one between white families and black families, it's not because one family worked 10 times harder. And I think we have to be honest about that. The fact that a black woman with breast cancer has a, is a 42% more likely to die from that than a white woman with breast cancer, we have to be honest about the structural racism that plays into the healthcare system. The fact that even right now when we're looking at COVID-19, when people say that COVID-19 has been the, the, the equal opportunity uh, uh, you know, a hitter and killer, that's just not true. And the stats don't back that up. Because if you look at it, also the impact of COVID-19 has also been incredibly color-coded, where African-Americans are twice as likely to not just contract and, and get infected, they're twice as likely to die from it. And so when I think about the fact that, you know, that we are twice as likely to not just get infected, but die from this and all the issues of systemic health racism that plays into the infection, but also systemic health racism and also economic injustice that plays into why we're just as twice as likely to die from it. These are things that we have to contend with as a larger society. And, and part of that, you know, and, and the understanding of that is not to play gotcha or I told you so or anything like that. But the reality is if we are going to be honest and truthful, then it means we have to understand that this was a country that was founded on a racial hierarchy. It was a country that was founded with stolen labor on stolen land. We have to understand that it did not just end with slavery, but after slavery, it went into black codes and reconstruction and Jim Crow and mass incarceration and all these other things that showed themselves in different ways that created these massive gaps in not just outcomes, but opportunities. These are things that we have to wrestle and contend with if we're ever going to be honest about, uh, about really fulfilling the, the larger dreams and hopes that this country, uh, that this country shared uh, and promised for everybody. Do you know, I think you're muted. Yeah. I'm sorry. There you go. Uh, I was saying that um, it's also the things that, you know, those those very values that America was built on are very hard to promote abroad uh, when, when we have been on this journey that, that that doesn't seem it's going fast enough. You know, I, I'll, re I'll never forget traveling to the Middle East uh, with Condi Rice. I think you were on one of those trips, Nick Burns and Anya. And I'll never forget being in rooms with kings and crown princes and high level ministers. And uh, it was during a difficult time, it was post Iraq. And some of them would say to her, we don't wanna hear America preach to us about democracy. And I'll never forget her answer and her strength. She would look them in the eye and she would say, I'm certainly not here to preach to you about democracy. It wasn't so long ago that I was considered three fifths of a man exactly. in my country. But what we have done is we have striven. We, have, we, have, we really are striving uh, on this long journey to get better. And that's what you should hope for your people. And it was always so powerful to me, the humility, uh, but also the hope that we're recognizing that we are at least moving forward. Where do you think we are today on that journey? Are we taking steps backward? Are we moving in the right direction? And what will we kind of think about with COVID and George Floyd? How can we make sure not to waste this moment of national reckoning? I, um, I, I, lo I, first, I, I love that story and it's so true. 
Uh, and it's so true that in order for us to have the kind of credibility that we need, uh, we've got to let people know that even though our history has been uneven, uh, that we have moved towards a sense of progress and we have to understand that yes, we've got work to do, but also work has been done. Um, I, I think about it actually in context of, of, of my grandfather. And uh, where my grandfather was actually the first one uh, on my mother's side of family born in the United States. He was born in, in Charleston, South Carolina and uh, spent his young years there. My great grandfather was a minister and a very vocal minister and started receiving a collection of threats and first they turned into vocal threats, then physical threats. Uh, to the point that in the middle of the night, my great grandfather picked up my grandfather and his family and they left. Uh, they didn't leave Charleston, they didn't leave South Carolina, they left the United States because the Ku Klux Klan ran them out. And so my grandfather then really was raised in Jamaica despite being born in the United States. And the majority of my family actually pledged to never come back here. And the majority of my family has not. They've never been back to the United States. Uh, but my grandfather did. And he always looked at it where he said, this was his birth home. And no one should have any form of jurisdictional authority as to where he spent his time or the place that he felt most connected to than him that he was proud to be an American. This is a person who, you know, again, always for his entire life spoke with a, with a deep Jamaican accent, uh, but was more proud to be American than anyone that I've ever known. And I think about his existence. I think about the fact that his earliest memories in this country were the country rejecting him. But he still spent his entire life, he moved back here, he went to Lincoln University and HBCU in Pennsylvania, um, raised his family here. Uh, and he always believed in what the hope of this country was. And I think about it in context of, of where we are now and where people say, you know, have we, you know, have we made progress? And the answer is not enough, but yes. And we have to recognize that and use that as a level of fuel and ammunition as we continue to push forward. Understanding the fact that, that two years ago, we had people who were calling for Black Lives Matter to be called a terrorist organization. A terrorist organization, an organization that was started by three black women after the death of Trayvon Martin, who started off initially as a hashtag, but then eventually turned it into a movement because they said, we feel like we have to remind this country that it's not the Black Lives Matter more, but that they actually matter and you cannot kill us with impunity. Mm -hmm. We now saw where that, where two years ago, there, there were calls for it to be listed as a terrorist organization. Now we've got every corporation trying to figure out a way to put it into their mission statement. Three words that just could not be more true, but also could not be more obvious when we're talking about the hope of this country, that black lives matter. We're talking about where even in a short period of time, we now know that the conversations are not just about justice for Mr. Floyd, and justice for the individual names that we now know and, and, and rattle off and, and unfortunately continue to get longer. But it's about how are we creating a level of measurable justice for an entire society? Mm -hmm. We're watching how people are making a collective movement, how, uh, uh, how we've watched a football team in, you know, in my home state who people have been calling for the name change for a very long time. And now within a matter of weeks, because we see a level of collective pressure, that yeah. the name is now gone. Much more unity. And I, I'm just going to jump in here because we've got a couple, we've got a lot of questions for you. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I uh, and not as much time as we wanted. Um, two, two men I admire greatly. Senator Sam Nunn has a, a question. Ah, uh, yes. Ambassador, Ambassador Tom Corlogas. Let me start with you, Senator Nunn and Tom, and then hopefully we can have at least one more question. Uh, yeah, Wes, we with terrific, terrific words of wisdom. Love your broad you, definition. Sir. Can you hear me? I do. Good to see you. Yeah. Love your broad definition of justice. Uh, question on national service. There's a lot of talk about national service. It was the first bill I introduced in the Senate in 1972. That shows you how effective I was because it hadn't happened yet, except in very limited ways with AmeriCorps. What do you think of national service as a way of bringing us together? and having us understand each other much better 
by working together and not just talking about it, but doing deeds together. Miss, uh, Miss Senator Nunn, it's great to see you. Uh, and also I say, I am not uh, in, favor of it, in favor of it, I'm in enthusiastically in favor of it. I, I know that some of the greatest joys and mercies that I have received in my life uh, have not been when I was wearing a suit or not when I was wearing uh, jeans or a t-shirt, but it was when, when I was wearing the uniform of this country. And, and for me, it was the uniform of the United States Army. But I don't care whether that is a green, whether it's a red city year jacket, or I don't care whether it is a Habitat for Humanity outfit, or I don't care whether it is as a school teacher in our urban or our rural or our suburban school districts where we know we have the highest needs. If we can instill a sense of, 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 of national unity and collective service for our people, for our young people, we are going to be better off. And actually, I would say, I think now is actually a really important time to do it because I think there's also gonna be an economic calculation for it. Where because of the dangers of COVID-19, because of not just the health, but the economic impacts of COVID-19, we are gonna have more and more people, more and more students, more and more people who are finishing up, who are now going to be thinking very carefully about how do I wanna spend these next, these next couple of years. And so we're actually watching a really interesting confluence where we're gonna have increasing need for our citizens, and also a population that are gonna have some different options and really need to think hard about what do I do in terms of my next steps. If we can come up with a truly calcified way of establishing national service and national service options, paid national, national service options for our young people, so they can go out, whether it is joining the armed forces or whether it is going to work as, as a teacher, whether it is you know, doing you know, cleanup supports, whether it is dealing with things like lead abatements. We have a collection of issues that we've got to take care of our society. And if we can create a national call and a national will for us to take care of our own issues, our own challenges, and have our young people help lead the way, it's not just going to be better for us in the short term, but frankly, it's going to be better for us in the long term as well. So I'm a huge proponent of it. And, uh, and I think it's something that we have, we can and should move on. And there's something right now, Senator uh, Nunn, that they really have, have done in your honor, which is the CORE Act, that is a bipartisan initiative. Senators Rubio, Blunt, Chris Coons is a lead co-sponsor. I hope everyone on this call will look that up and support it, because it does exactly what you and the Senator are talking about, double the number of service slots and increase uh, pay, and quite frankly, recognize that essential workers have finally receive the dignity they need, the Amen. EMP, the nurse, the grocery worker, et cetera. So thank you, Senator. And last question, Ambassador Coralogos, and then we'll turn it over to Anya to close us out. Uh, this has been an awesome session. Thank you so much, Wes, for everything you do. Thank you. Ambassador? I think, Tom, are you trying to unmute to ask the question? Yes, how's that? I hear you. Well, uh, I, I start over a uh, fascinating tale there, Wes. I, I'm impressed uh, uh, with, with your record and Dina, good questions. Uh, let me ask you something. I have long held a theory that the younger uh, preschool kids uh, get into diversity, get into, get into playing with other uh, racially mixed kids I remember growing up in Salt Lake, and I didn't care about anybody. Could he catch passes? Uh, could he? Could he? Uh, you know, if he if he hits well, fine. If he doesn't, go sit on the bench like I did. Uh, is there any way we can promote younger uh, generations of uh, of school children uh, as they grow up? Finally, they don't care what color anybody is. Uh, What's, am I wrong on that or how wrong am I? What, what do you think of that theory, Wes? You're, 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 you're not wrong at all. In fact, I, I can say that some of the most powerful experiences that I had uh, was actually when I had a chance to get into environments where, 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 where the people who I were around were no one like the people that I came up with, right? I mean, I think about my military experience. You know, when I had, one of the things I loved about my military experience was the fact that I was now serving with people who had completely different backgrounds from me and I was learning from them every single day. And I, but I think you bring up an important point also about history and about curriculum. 
because also some of the most important things that happened to me uh, when I was coming up was I got a chance and it wasn't through school, but I got a chance to learn more about history and I got a chance to learn about the history of not just, you know, my own history, but the history of others. I got a chance to learn about the beauty of the contributions of people like James Baldwin and Langston Hughes and Sojourner Truth and Paul Robeson. And why that mattered is it did two things. One, it showed me that every room that I'm in, I'm there because I belong there. And that I'm not there because of someone's benevolence or, or kindness, but it was really, it was because of this amazing lineage of giants that paved the way for me. But the other reason why that becomes really important is it's important for other kids to know that too. It's important for other kids to understand the breadth and the contributions of people who might not look like them, who might not come from their background, but how it's actually been that kaleidoscope that makes this country so special. And so I, 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 I agree that we have to come up with ways of having kids, our young people at our earliest stages, being able to work together, learn together, grow together, laugh together, play together. But we also have to make sure we're thinking in a really true and core and crucial way about the curriculum, the stories, the images that we're asking our children to inherit and interpret. Because that's also gonna, that also will break down any forms of barriers or fears that our kids have of actually being able to work and grow together as well. Thank you, Wes. Those are really inspiring words and really important at this time. Let me ask you, we've got very little time left, but maybe just in 30 seconds, leave us with some optimism. I know Robin Hood helps so many organizations that are at the core front of anti-poverty efforts. What's the best innovation you've seen recently and what are they doing? And maybe in 30 seconds. I, I say in, in 30 seconds, the, the most powerful thing that, that we can and, and, and are doing is how are we utilizing what we think is the most powerful element to the organization, which is our voice. Each and every one of us are gonna have a collective impact and have an opportunity to have a true collective impact in our society right now. And you know, we, pull the, we can pull together really special initiatives like we have one called the Power Fund, which is focusing on being able to address leaders of color because all the third party research and all of our research shows that people who are closest to the problems are oftentimes gonna be closest to the solutions. We can do things like the relief fund and get capital and money out the door quickly to be able to address issues such as cash assistance and issues such as infrastructure rebuilding within the philanthropic sector. But I think the other thing that we really wanna be able to do is be able to align with community members, align with policymakers, align with philanthropists and say, now is a moment for all of us to say, what else can we do? How else can we push? And I think one of the really exciting things that we're seeing right now in this moment is we are watching a response to that that has just been truly, truly humbling. And so I'm hopeful for the future and I'm hopeful because we all are finding unique ways to have a vested interest in. Great, thank you so much, Dina. Thank you so much, Wes.